So recall what we were doing. So we defined something called large sieve inequalities. So these are inequalities of the following form. So you have a family. And you look at linear forms like this, and then take absolute value squares. And this n runs from m to m plus n, where m will play no role. So only the length of the sequence will matter. And that is less than or equal to some delta times norm a square. And this should hold for every sequence and norm a square means l2 norm and we saw also that uh, uh, one can always take delta equal to the length n times the size of the family. So this is a finite family. So this is just Cauchy's inequality. And uh, The best case scenario is is delta of the size uh, length plus the size of the family. So here, this symbols means uh, so this means uh, both less, less, and greater, greater. OK, and we saw an example that, uh, that was this theorem 0, where uh, we were getting this best case scenario, which is you sum over all characters, usually character about Q, and chi n square. And this is less than or equal to n plus pi of q to norm s square. OK, and we remarked that uh, when we have the best case scenario, uh, large sieve, uh, so such a, uh, such a large sieve inequality is called uh, a sharp large sieve inequality. And a sharp large sieve inequality is of the same strength as what Riemann hypothesis gives, but on average over a family. So for example, this will give you, so if you take mu n, a n equal to mu n, it will give you, this is like root n. If, uh, And this is of the same strength as, uh, but on average. Over chi. And uh, this is what Riemann hypothesis will give you. And that is quite easy to see because uh, if you write mu n chi n, n of two n, using uh, Perron's formula, you get, let's say, over 2, sum of mu n chi n over n to the power s times n power s by s ds. Now, Riemann hypothesis, so this thing is the inverse of Dirichlet function. This is a ls chi inverse. And if you assume Riemann hypothesis, Riemann hypothesis tells you that all the zeros of LS chi are 
on the line real part of s equal to half, which means that you can shift the contours to half plus epsilon. So we assume Rh for Ls chi, then we can shift the contour to half plus epsilon. And that will give this bound into the half plus epsilon. The way I have done it, there will be a problem with convergence over the imaginary part, but that can be handled by smoothing or other methods, so that's not a difficult issue. And this gives Okay, so that's the correction. So now I will uh, start some new things. So we saw one example of a large sieve. Uh, let me give some more examples without proof. So examples of large sieve inequality. So. Okay, so one is the famous theorem of Vinogradov. Uh, sorry, the theorem of Heath Brown. So it says that uh, sum over m, m odd and square free, sum over n, n square free. A n, and then Jacobi symbol <coughs> n by m square, that is less less m n to the epsilon m plus n into norm A square. So again, this is almost sharp. Up to this epsilon power, it is sharp. And the reason this happens, we have such a strong large sieve, is because there is an orthogonality of quadratic characters. These are the quadratic characters, real valued. And uh, so just like we have an orthogonality of Dirichlet character, uh, if we sum over quadratic characters, sum over the discriminant, uh, we can invert them by reciprocity, and then we can use points of summation formula that gives you some kind of an orthogonality. And that's the key to proving this. So another example, right in the, so of course I won't prove it, it's quite, uh, it's, it's not very easy, it, it involves some complicated induction. The main idea is uh, this orthogonality of quadratic characters. Another result uh, is, so if you sum over, let's say, H, K, Q, I'll explain what it means. That will be bounded by N plus K, Q. So let, let's put it less, less to norm a square. All these bounds are for every uh, sequence A. So where H Q is uh, an ortho normal AK basis, of cusp forms, of weight k and 
level n, level q. And uh, lambda f n is the coefficient of uh, the nth Fourier coefficient of f. So I am not being too very precise here because I am not very sure about the normalization, but if you normalize correctly, then you should get this kind of bound. And in fact, there are many large sieve inequalities. So for example, one can have, uh, here you can have something like uh, E of G n where G is a polynomial in n. So. Okay, so these are just examples. So the next thing I am going to, uh, the next thing I'm going to state is called uh, additive uh, large sieve inequality. So this one I will prove, so I will uh, state it carefully. So first some notation. So for a real number alpha, we define norm of alpha to be the distance from the nearest integer. So example, uh, so let's say, uh, what is the norm of uh, say 0 0.9 minus 0 0.1? So, so it's better to look at a picture. So suppose this is 0, this is 1, so 0 0.9 is somewhere here. 0 0.1 is somewhere here. So it won't be this distance, but it will be the sum of these two distance, because you see, it is the, so if you subtract, you'll get 0.8, and the nearest integer to 0.8 is 1, and if you subtract, you'll get 0 0.2. And you can see it like this way, that if you identify 0 and 1, then it is the distance between, you know, sum of these two distance. So this is the natural distance on R mod Z. So we will consider R mod Z. And now in this space, you can identify R mod Z with 0, the interval 0 to 1 with 0 and 1 identified. You can also identify it with a unit circle. So on this space, this is a very natural uh, metric. Oh, why am I using this? is the theorem we want to do. So theorem, I've got it here, one, this is the additive large sieve. So suppose alpha one, alpha two, is a set of points on R mod Z that are delta spaced or some delta. That is, so what does it mean delta spaced? It means that alpha R and alpha S are separated by delta for any R and S where R and S are different. 
so obviously such a set has to be finite. So I, I will just remark that, uh, so, so note that the number of such points, um, points that are delta spaced, This is at most, uh, so you see what's happening. I have the interval 0 to 1, but I have identified 0 with 1. And now I am counting how many points can there be which are delta spaced. So it's at most uh, something like 1 by delta. Maybe 1 by delta plus 1, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah. So let, let's call it 1 by delta plus 1. Even if I am wrong by 1, it doesn't matter. Is it true, 1 by delta plus 1, or 1 by delta is enough? I'm not sure. Anyway, so, so it's a finite set in particular. Okay. okay, so the theorem says that then, is uh, sum over R. So this is a s running over the set of points. A n, E of n alpha R. So 1 by delta plus n minus 1 into norm A square. So for all any sequence n. Okay. So note that uh, we checked that uh, the size of the family here is the, so here the harmonics are these alpha r's and the number of alpha r is about 1 by delta. So this is the size of the family and this is the length. So we are in a, a sharp large sieve situation. So we are going to prove it but a little weaker version. Because uh, to prove this exact with exact same uh, constant, uh, you need quite intricate machinery like Hilbert's inequality, which will take a long time. So we'll give a weaker bound, which is sufficient for applications. So, so uh, weaker version. Conversion is uh, same thing, sum over R. So, A N E N alpha R. But I will now write less less, so I don't care about the constant. And I also don't care about this one because it is absorbed in this constant. So this bound. So uh, we shall prove this uh, version. So we shall okay. But before proving this, uh, let's state another large sieve, which is sometimes called the large sieve inequality. This was theorem one, so this will be theorem two. So in the literature, when one says we apply the large sieve inequality, it means this. So it says that sum over Q up to Q uh, yes, and the sum over M ah, no, there is another sum. A 
mod q star q up to q square is less than or equal to the next line q square plus n minus 1 into norm a square. Let's see if this is correct. Yes. And uh, <coughs> weaker version. So the left hand side the same, but now I will just say q square plus n norm a square. So again, we shall prove the weaker version. But uh, in fact, this, this theorem uh, implies this theorem. And that is not difficult to see. So the stronger version will imply the stronger version, weaker version will imply the weaker version. So, uh, so claim theorem 1 implies theorem 2. Why is that? So take alpha r, this set, to be the set of a by q, where a runs from 1 to q, a, q are co-prime, and q goes up to capital Q. Okay, so yeah, yeah. I mean, when I put this, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. This is oh no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. What am I writing? Uh, this one. Yeah. The, the family is this. So here, the harmonics are this a by q's with q going. So a is varying from 1 to q minus 1, which are co-prime, and then q is varying up to q. So the number of harmonics is here, it will be phi of q. And now I'm summing over q, and phi of q is of roughly the same size as q. So if you sum up to capital Q, we'll get q square. So q square is the size of the family. So this is again a sharp large sieve situation. Yeah, sorry, I, I, there is an absolute value. So yeah, I should make a remark here that uh, at the size of the set, so A by Q, where, uh, see when I write this, 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 I can identify the residue classes by this thing, right, A Q co prime and q is up to q. So the size of the set is sum over phi q. And this is uh, roughly of size q square. So this q square is this one. Yeah, so this is my family. Uh, this I choose as my alpha r. So the question is whether these alpha r's are, these points are well spaced, so let's check. Take two arbitrary elements from them. Look at their difference. So this is, I just subtract. So this is A1 Q2 minus A2 Q1 by Q1 Q2. But this number, whatever it is, it's at least one. Absolute value at least one. So this is one by Q1 Q2. And that is less less 1 by q square, because q1 and q2 are all smaller than capital Q. So we can take delta to be points are delta spaced, where delta equals 1 by q square. And that's why uh, theorem 1 will give you theorem 2. 
And I should make a remark that this bound is the best possible. That was, I think, proved by Montgomery. So a remark. I'm going to erase it now. Mark. So 1 by delta plus n by 1 is the best possible. Okay. And I will state another theorem. This is called Bombieri Davenport theorem. So this is quite useful when you study primes in arithmetic progressions. So it says sum over q up to q, q by phi of q. So this is some normalization. And since phi q is roughly of same size as q, this is almost like 1 for on average. Chi mod q, chi primitive. And that will be again bounded by q square plus n minus 1, norm a square. And uh, <coughs> I won't prove it, but theorem 3 follows from theorem 2. So let me write a remark. So what should I write? I'll write below. by writing, you see, what is the difference between theorem 2 and theorem 3? Here we have an additive character, and there we have a multiplicative character. But I can go pass from multiplicative to additive characters and vice versa by Gauss sums. So you can write this uh, chi in terms of additive character. So. So this tau is the Gauss sum, tau chi bar. So this is A mod Q. Oh no, this is fine. Uh, because chi A will take care of that. And A by Q. So if you replace chi N by this, then after some manipulation, uh, you have to apply theorem 2. And after some manipulation, you will obtain this theorem. So I'm not going to do it because I don't need theorem 3. I only need theorem 2. And uh, theorem 2, we have already proved, assuming theorem 1, so I need to prove theorem 1. OK, so I'm going to prove the weaker version. So let's <coughs> erase this. Tau is the Gauss sum. So this is the Gauss sum associated to chi. No, it is just uh, usual Fourier expansion. So uh, see these additive characters. So there's a space of periodic functions with period q that's a vector space of dimension q. And the additive characters, so let's just say, q periodic sequences. 
So these are sequences with which have period Q. So this is a vector space, so C vector space of dimension Q. And you can have many bases like uh, you know one zero 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 and then one zero 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 then zero one zero 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 etc. But the interesting basis is uh, so a going to e of n a by q. This is obviously a periodic function. Uh, so don't do that. So x goes to uh, n goes to uh, so this is a periodic function for every a. So consider this function and. Uh, a from 0 to q minus 1. So these are, these, these functions form a basis. So this is a basis. So that one can easily check. And to check that you have to use orthogonality. So once you know this is a basis then, and Dirichlet character chi is the periodic function, so chi can be expanded in terms of additive character. And once you compute the Fourier coefficients, so any any periodic function f, so let's write if f is any q periodic sequence, I can expand f as f. Let's call this function e a times e a. Where EA is this function. Okay. So any, so therefore, uh, if you have a Dirichlet character, it will be the inner product. And once you compute the inner product, you see this will be like one upon Gauss sum. So, so uh, a good reference for this. Uh, let me state some reference. This I can erase because I have. So the most basic reference is, is Davenport. So one is Davenport. Multiplicative number theory. The other one is Montgomery and Vaughan. Same title. Um, so let's say <laughs> Ivan H. Kowalski. Uh, analytic number theory. And I think chapter six will be large sieve. And there is, of course, a famous book by Bomberi, but it's written in French. Uh, I don't remember the full name. Let's Ah, okay. La, <laughs> La Grand Cribble? Ah, okay. Ah, like, okay. Yeah. Okay, so now we prove uh, the weaker version of additive large series, this one. So here the assumption was uh, this set is delta spaced. Let's prove it. Yeah, it's proof. So I am going to apply duality. So <laughs> recall, duality tells you that this statement is equivalent to the statement where I interchange n with r. And this arbitrary sequence n will be 
replaced by a sequence indexed by R. So duality, we need to prove the following statement that sum over n sum over r, let's call it gamma r, the coefficient, and the harmonics remains the same, is less, less. So whatever constant we uh, want to prove, it will be the same constant. Now it will be gamma square here for any, for all gamma. all gamma r that are delta spaced. Oh, no, no, sorry, uh, delta p spaced are alpha r. So these are arbitrary complex number, yeah. So for all sequences. And recall that the number of r is roughly one by delta. Okay, so we want to prove this statement. And the obvious thing to do would be to square it out, to open the square, then interchange the sum, then you'll have a sum over n with e of n alpha r. So that's, that's a geometric sum. So you can apply the formula for geometric sum, and uh, you should get something. And we will do almost the same thing, except we will smooth the whole thing. So I'll put a function here, which will be a smooth function. So then it will be sum over n with a smooth function, and then instead of applying the geometric sum formula, we are going to apply points of summation formula. So that simplifies life much more. So, so let uh, f be a map, um, c infinity map, f from r to r, such that Uh, fx and f at x, the Fourier transform, both decay like 1 by 1 plus x square, and fx is uh, greater than or equal to 1 for, ah, no, it's not absolute value, just x uh, for x between minus 1 and 1. Okay, so how can we find such a function? So let me give an example. So, for example, consider gx equals e to the power minus u square, uh, maybe pi u square. This is the Gaussian. So then, of course, g is smooth, and I know that g hat of x is, this is x, is again gx, right? This is the, you are familiar with this function, right? The Gaussian is its own Fourier transform. And obviously, this function satisfies, this decays quite rapidly, so it is certainly satisfying this. But uh, this condition may not be satisfied because, for example, when x is 1, it will be to the minus pi. So you take, so define, uh, so we can take fx equal to uh, e power pi times gx, then it will satisfy this condition. Okay, so I have such a function. I have demonstrated one function that satisfies this. Now what I'm going to do is, I will say this is bounded by, so I will call this some s, so I will say that So note that 
S is bounded by sum over N. Now, this is no longer a discrete, this is not a finite sum, it's an infinite sum. Here I will put F of N minus M divided by N, and then whatever we have. Right, because when n is between m and m plus n, this thing will be larger than 1. This condition is, will ensure that this is larger than 1. And then I have some extra terms, but since everything is positive, I get an upper bound. Okay. So I'm not losing anything, I'm putting some extra things. So, so the, but this is an upper bound, so that's fine. And I will show that this sum itself is smaller than this right hand side. Okay, and now the next step will be to open the square. And uh, E of, I uh, know, uh, now sum over N, F of E of N into alpha r minus alpha s. Okay, do you agree? I'm just opening the square, then interchanging the sum. So I'll get gamma, uh, gamma s bar, and e to the n alpha s will become minus because it's complex conjugate, uh, that's what I'll get. And now the plan is to apply Poisson summation formula for this sum. So recall, Poisson summation formula. So suppose uh, uh, F and if you know, um, so let's say F and F at F is smooth and it need not be uh, smooth, but let's assume that and uh, fx has some decay to ensure convergence. So if at both are decaying like one plus square, then sum of fn equals sum of f at n. That is called Poisson summation formula. So I'm going to apply it there. Uh, so, I keep the statement. So, here, uh, you know, what is a fat of y? This is the Fourier transform, so this is the integral over r, fx, e of minus xy dx, where uh, we use the notation that E of uh, alpha means E to the power 2 pi i alpha. So this notation I'm going to use everywhere. So I also already used here, right? Yeah, yeah, I should have defined it earlier. So E alpha means this. Okay, so after points of summation, what shall we get? This sum over R and S, I don't touch. This sum over N becomes sum over M. I'm just writing a different uh, letter. So then <coughs> it will be, so this entire function, so let's just call it G or something like that. So G hat of M. Where GX is the function uh, where I replace n by x, right? This is what points of summation will tell you. So this is g of n, this entire thing. So I'll get g hat of n. And what is g hat of m? This is 
is integral g x e of minus m x d x. So, this is f of x minus m by n e of uh, x into alpha r minus alpha s minus m, right? dx, and now I make a change of variable. put x equals uh, m plus n u. So, then this integral becomes, uh, so g hat m is uh, f of u e of m plus n u into alpha r minus alpha s minus m. You, uh, yeah. Now I will pull out the things that do not involve u. So, uh, ah, also uh, dx will become n du. So there is an n outside. So this is n, and then uh, something will come out. So let's see what comes out. So m into this thing comes out. M into And integral f u e of n u into alpha r minus alpha s minus m d u. Okay, so so I started with the sum s and uh, then. With this sum, I expanded and I applied points of summation. So S is now bounded by n. Ah, sorry. So there is sum over R and S, comma R, comma S bar, and uh, what else is there? Yeah, nothing else. So so a, there is n, so that comes out, and uh, e of this thing. Ah, no, so sum over n has to be here. So I think at this stage I can uh, put absolute value. So let's put absolute value. So then this thing will be gone. And then sum over m. And this is what? This is nothing but. Uh, Yeah, so this is like Fourier transform at uh, this thing, and there is a minus m n u that will also be gone, right? So this is uh, so e of minus uh, minus m n u. And, uh, oh no, so what am I saying? No, no, it, it has to be there, sorry. This is, this is just a fat of uh, n into alpha r minus alpha s minus m. Yeah, that, that's the definition of Fourier transform, right? Yeah. U times n into this. So, and I, I can put an absolute value. So I'm giving an upper bound. This, this has absolute value one, so that is gone, and that's the bound. Okay, is that? Okay, and now I have a, by assumption, uh, you know, a fat as a bound, so I'm going to apply the bound. So. Therefore, S uh, 
fellow is bounded by n times sum over r and s, gamma r, gamma s, and uh, 1 upon 1 plus n into alpha r, oh, sorry, there is a sum over m, sum over m, 1 upon 1 plus n into alpha r minus alpha s minus m square. Okay? Okay. And now I have to handle this sum, uh, sum over m. So note that, you see, this alpha r, alpha s are in r mod z, so which means they are in uh, the interval 0 to 1, where we identify 1 and 0. So alpha r minus alpha s is between minus 1 and plus 1. So what we shall do is, uh, we will treat those integers m which are 0, 1, or minus 1 separately. So we shall write sum over m as m belongs to the set minus 1, 0, and 1. So we'll do one treatment, the other sum will be uh, so. So m is in z minus this set minus 1, 0, and 1. Okay, you will see why we are doing this. So the easy case is when m is away from 0. So suppose m is uh, m is not equal to 0, 1, or minus 1, then alpha r minus alpha s minus n uh, right, that is, uh, uh, so I want to compare it with, uh, So I, I want to give an upper bound, so which means I need a lower bound for the denominator. And uh, this should be smaller than n minus 1 whole square. Is that correct? Yeah, that is always correct, I think. And that is small, greater than n square up to some constant. Let's say n square by 10. Right? For when n is outside this, I, these things are valid. So therefore, I can lower bound. So I have this expression. So I can put, I, uh, so I need an upper bound for this whole thing. So I need a lower bound for this part. So I can put just n times m square when m is different from those things. Okay, so this is uh, one observation, and if m belongs to this set, uh, th this is uh, this is m. If m belongs to this set, then it is very it can be very close to alpha r minus alpha s. Then uh, we will just say that alpha r minus alpha s minus m square is uh, less greater than or equal to norm of alpha r minus alpha s. Okay. So applying this observation, so hence, so applying this too, so we have two cases. By one and two, I'll just take a few seconds. So we were up to this stage. This one. No, there was bar, but I'm taking absolute value, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. 
So uh, S is bounded by uh, N times R S gamma R gamma S and then uh, what is there? Yeah. So here I'll put less less. So I don't care, care about the constant. So outside this set, I have just m square. So I will ignore the other things. So I will just get uh, one upon uh, n m square because I'm giving a lower bound. So so sum over m. 1 upon uh, so here uh, you know m is different from 0 okay so how to write it so m is not in 0 1 minus 1 and uh, oh, there is an n also so nm. And for the other thing, I, I just have, uh, yeah, sum over m. So the other thing I will have just n times uh, 1 upon what? 1 plus n into one second, why is it? Just that times norm of uh, alpha r minus alpha s square. No, that can't be correct. What am I saying? Where is the problem? There is sum over m. What am I doing with the sum over m? Yeah, that's, a, uh, that's only three terms, so it is just uh, 1 upon uh, n alpha r minus alpha s. Yeah. So there is a sum over r and s, so I have to take care of that. And this sum will be very small because sum of 1 by m squared is bounded. So I will start from this step next time. So this proof is a bit... Uh, uh, it requires some calculation, it's not there. Okay, so I'll stop here.